All right, so here we will discuss yet another metric on probability measures called Wasserstein metric. Now, just like in the previous uh, section, we will assume from the beginning that our metric space is separable. Of course, separability will be used uh, in essential ways in uh, various places here, but from the very beginning, when we consider a distance between points on the metric space, we want this to be a measurable function. So already we need some condition on a metric space, and so without mentioning, we'll always assume that the space is separable. Now this metric that we are going to define, this time it will be defined not on all probability measures, but on the following subset of probability measures, which we will denote by this calligraphic P1 of S. And these will be all probability measures on our space. Uh, by default, we always consider the Borel sigma algebra, the probability measures on the Borel sigma algebra. But here we will have this assumption that the integral of the distance from any given point x0 with respect to these probability measures will be finite. Okay, And so these will be all probability measures with respect to which the distance function is integrable. And of course the, the choice of the point x0 here does not matter by triangle inequality. Okay, you can replace x0 by any other point. So um, this condition will be if it's true for one point, it's true for all points. Now again we will be considering here or working with uh, the probability measures on the product space of S product with itself, which in the last section we will we'll denote it MPQ, and these are just all probability measures mu on the product space with the product Borel sigma algebra such that mu has marginals P and Q. Right, and now we define the Wasserstein metric or Wasserstein distance between probability measures P and Q in this collection P1 as follows. So here is the definition. Okay, given two probability measures P and Q in, in P1, we define this quantity called WPQ which is this Weierstein distance between P and Q as the infimum of the integral of the distance between X and Y with respect to measure mu on the product space S times S, where we take infimum over uh, this set of probability measures that we just defined with marginals P and Q. Okay, so that's that's the definition of the Wasserstein distance between P and Q. All right, so let's start with some general comments about this quantity here that we define. Okay, first of all, it's easy to show, and this will be left as an exercise, that if P and Q are tight, Okay, then this infimum is achieved. Okay, so you can take some, let's say, uh, measure mu star with marginals p and q such that w will be e equal to this integral with respect to this measure mu star. The next comment is um, the common interpretation of this quantity as optimal transport. Okay, so in this interpretation, one thinks of the metric function as a cost of moving point x uh, to point y. Or maybe more precisely, a cost of moving a unit mass at x to, to y. And then these measures mu over which we optimize they are viewed as a 
sort of transport plan of moving a distribution P into a distribution Q. So if you think of a distribution P as a distribution of mass over the space, so then the, this coupling, this measure mu with marginals P and Q can be viewed as a transport um, plan of moving one pile into another. Okay, so this, this is viewed as a transport plan of moving P to Q. And in particular, if your um, distribution has a conditional, regular conditional probability of, let's say, second coordinate given the first one, for example, again, if, if the metric space is complete, then you can rewrite this integral that we are trying to minimize. Okay, you can rewrite it as a integral, as a double integral, where first you integrate with respect to y. So let's say there is there exists a conditional distribution of y given x. And then you integrate with respect to x. So if you can rewrite it like this, then you know this interpretation maybe becomes a little bit more clear. You can think of this conditional distribution as, as a way to redistribute uh, a point mass at x on, on, the whole, all the, on the whole metric space S. Okay, so that, that's the interpretation of this optimization problem, minimizing, finding this coupling of two probability measures mu, such that the average cost of uh, transporting one probability measure into another in this sense is as small as possible on that, okay? All right, so then another comment here is that what we are doing is morally not that far from what we were doing in the previous section when we discussed Strassen's theorem. Okay, so there is there is this clear relation to what we were doing or in clear relation to the measure mu that we were looking in Strassen's theorem or constructing in, in Strassen's theorem. In particular, if you take a look at one of the exercises in at the end of the last section, there is this interpretation of, of, of the measure mu constructed in Strassen's theorem as the measure that minimizes the following functional. Okay, so we have this two parameters a and b and then if you look at the measure outside of the diagonal of size a okay and here let me rewrite it as as an integral of an indicator of the set outside of the diagonal or away from the diagonal by a distance more than a okay then what was going on in Strassen's theorem is in a sense a minimization of this quantity, where you try to find infimum again over all measures with prescribed marginals p and q. Okay, and so if you look at that exercise, now you can see that the difference here is that in Wasserstein metric we try to minimize the average distance, while in Strassen's theorem the cost function was was uh, this discrete indicator, right? If the distance is, exceeds A, then the cost is 1. The distance within A uh, is the cost is 0, okay? So these two sections, they are morally very much related to each other. All right, another observation is that uh, one can easily check that Wasserstein metric dominates the levy prokhorov and bounded Lipschitz metrics. So we'll see in a second that the bounded Lipschitz metric, okay, we'll need it in one of the proofs very soon. So although this is an exercise, we'll see that W is bigger than beta. And one of the exercises also asks to show that the levy prokhorov metric squared is bounded by this W metric. Alright, then the next 
comment I wanted to make is that if you consider just the real line, so our metric space, if it's a real line with the usual, usual Euclidean distance, okay, then of course by definition here the Wasserstein metric is just the expectation of the distance, but the distance here is just x minus y. Okay, for some pair of random variables, okay, because this infimum is achieved on the real line, you have some optimal distribution on, on, on the plane. So in other words, you, you have some kind of coupled pair of random variables with distribution uh, with distributions p and q such that this distance is, is just the expectation of um, this difference between them. Okay, so you have this very concrete um, definition or interpretation of, of this distance here, which is already useful as we'll see in some examples um, in this form, but I also wanted to mention that on the real line uh, more is known. In fact, the specific coupling of x and y uh, will give you uh, this Wasserstein distance. This optimal coupling will be as follows. Okay, so here more, more is known. And although we don't prove this in the notes, you know, if you open any book on optimal transportation, you can find uh, this result, so I wanted to mention it anyway, that if you consider cumulative distribution functions corresponding to these distributions, so f and g are cumulative distribution function of p and q correspondingly, okay, then you can take these optimal um, coupling these random variables x and y to be just quantile transform transforms of the same uniform random variable u. Right? So you can take quantiles of these CDFs and you can just plug in the same u which is uh, has a uniform distribution on 0, 1. Okay, so um, in particular this optimal measure in, in the definition will be just the law of, of these quantile transforms okay. coupled, you know, because they are defined through the same uniform um, random variable. Okay. And so on the real line you, you have this even more explicit definition if you like. And this kind of um, you know, clean and explicit definition in terms of random variables, it's, it, it's the reason why this metric is sometimes so useful. So this will be illustrated more in, in the exercises, but let me just give here one maybe slightly artificial but very quick example of how would you prove that the Wasserstein distance between the convolution of P with itself and convolution of Q with itself can be controlled by two times the Wasserstein distance between P and Q. Okay, how can you see this? Well, you can see this because if you take an optimal coupling, uh, let's call it mu star, or with marginals P and Q, so this optimal coupling of P and Q, and then take these pairs of random variables x and y and another independent copy let's call it x2, y2 so these pairs are independent of each other but of course within the pair they are coupled to have this distribution mu star then on the one hand you know that the Wasserstein distance between p and q is just it's written explicitly in terms of these random variables here um, x and y, but on the other hand you know that the convolution by definition is just the distribution of the sum of two independent copies. So x1 plus x2 will have distribution 
given by this convolution of P with itself, and Y1 plus Y2 will have a distribution given by a convolution of Q with itself. So in other words, this X and this Y is some coupling of these convolutions. And it's not necessarily optimal, so if you are looking at the Wasserstein distance between these convolutions, you know that it's less than or equal than the suboptimal coupling between x and y, right? So for this particular choice of x and y, they have marginals that we want, but perhaps this is not optimal, so we have this inequality. But of course, on the other hand, if you now um, plug in the definition and use triangle inequality, you can see that this is bounded by right, these two expectations in terms of these pairs, which were optimal coupling of P and Q. So on this side, you see you now get twice the Wasserstein distance between P and Q. Okay, and this was a very simple calculation because the distribution or the distributions that we were interested in on the left-hand side had this explicit definition in terms of random variables. Right? And in many situations, one um, defines some kind of distribution in terms of functions of other random variables, some combinations of other random variables. And as a result, you know, if that function has a good properties, one may use it to relate the Wasserstein distance uh, for this, you know, for, for this distribution in terms of the distributions of the original random variables. And this can be very useful. And one can see in, in the exercises some applications of this, of this idea. Okay. But just a quick illustration of uh, why Wasserstein distance it can be very useful in applications. Okay. All right. Um, one more thing that I wanted to discuss in, in this part here is that indeed this quantity W that we define is a metric on that subset of probability measures. Okay, so we'll finish this particular video with the following lemma. Okay, that if, again, I emphasize that the metric space is separable, Okay, then this W is a metric on the probability measures, on the set of probability measures, such that the distance function is integrable. And of course, we limit its, um, maybe I didn't mention this, but we limit ourselves to this subset because in the definition we do integrate the distance function. So we want it to be integrable. All right, so let's discuss how the proof goes. And I'm going to give the detail proved only in the case when um, the space is also complete. And then I will just sketch you know, how one approaches this a little bit differently in the, when you do not have completeness. Okay. But that um, is only important in, in the proof of triangle inequality. So first, let's discuss the symmetry, which of course is, is just obvious by the definition. Okay, And the fact that if the distance between P and Q is zero, right, we want to show that P is equal to Q. So, we want to show this, and of course this will follow from an inequality that I already mentioned above as an exercise that W dominates the bounded Lipschitz metric, and we already know that, that that's a metric. So let, let's prove this inequality that W is greater or equal than beta, okay, which is uh, pretty straightforward. All right, so take any function f 
uh, which is a bounded Lipschitz function on our space so that appears in the definition of beta and let's also take this measure mu with marginals p and q that appears in the definition of uh, w and then since uh, f is Lipschitz we have this relation that f of x minus f of y now you can also put the absolute value but I will just write it like that without absolute value so this is bounded by the Lipschitz norm times the distance between x and y and then integrate both sides with respect to mu okay. so you have integral of f of x minus f of y with respect to mu is less than this Lipschitz constant times this integral that we see in the definition of the Wasserstein metric okay but notice that on the left hand side f depends only on x or only on y so when you integrate on the left hand side you're actually integrating with respect to the marginals which are fixed to be uh, p and q right and now you get exactly the quantity on the left hand side in the definition of the bounded Lipschitz metric you compare the integrals with respect to p and with respect to q okay and so then what remains is is just to take a supremum on the left hand side over all bounded Lipschitz functions um, with the Lipschitz norm actually you know here you can even take Lipschitz norm less than or equal than one but in the bounded Lipschitz metric the definition is uh, you take supremum over the unit ball in in the bounded Lipschitz uh, in the space of bounded Lipschitz functions right and so the Lipschitz norm will be less than one so we can just write it as one and on the right hand side you take infimum over all these mu with marginals p and q and you get what you want right you get exactly beta is less than or equal than uh, w and then the main part of this proof which requires a little bit more work is a triangle inequality All right so we consider we have to consider now three measures let's say p q and t and then we have to prove the triangle inequality so we want to prove that w p and t is bounded by the sum w p q plus w q t okay. and so what we'll do now is take on the optimal measures or nearly optimal measures on on the right hand side okay so here in the definition of this w you have some nearly optimal measure mu and in the definition of the second w you have you know another ne nearly optimal coupling or measure let's call it nu okay and of course nearly optimal means that it it approximates infimum within some parameter epsilon right so you know that the integral of the distance between x and y with respect to mu that will be almost the infimum right so it will be within epsilon of the infimum and the same for the second distance between q and q and t right and then the idea is to use these two nearly optimal coupling of p and q and q and t to construct some coupling between p and t which witnesses this triangle inequality now that coupling doesn't have to be optimal so in other words we want to combine these two to construct some measure eta with marginals p and t okay, such that the integral with respect to that marginal distribution okay so the integral between x and 
z with respect to eta will be less than the sum of these two integrals. Right? And so the question is how do you find this, um, how do you construct this measure eta? Because if you construct, you know that perhaps it's not optimal, but it does give us the triangle inequality, right? Because the optimal measure would only decrease this integral, so w between p and t is, is a smaller quantity. And on the other side, you get exactly what you want in the triangle inequality plus 2 epsilon. Okay? And then you can get rid of epsilon. And so the question here is in the middle. How do you construct this data? And in the case, if your metric space is complete, this is quite straight, straightforward. It's, um, in fact, something similar was done in the exercises when we discussed regular conditional probabilities. Okay, so suppose for a second that the metric space is also complete okay, in addition to being separable. Okay, so in this case we know that the conditional distributions are well defined or they exist. So we can say that conditional distributions of let's say x given y with respect to measure mu and z given y with respect to measure mu are well defined or, or exist. In this case we will construct um, this measure eta as what is called a conditionally independent coupling of these two uh, measures mu and, and, uh, and nu. Both of these have marginal y. They share the coordinate y, which has distribution q. And so we'll construct first a measure on the triple of coordinates x, y, z in such a way that given y, so y will have a distribution q, but given y, coordinates x will be independent and will have these conditional distributions that we just um, mentioned exist. Okay, so this is so-called conditionally independent coupling. Okay, which just means that um, you, we will construct measure gamma on three coordinates in such a way that it will have a conditional distribution for the pair x and z given y to be just the product of these conditional distributions above. Of measure, conditional distribution of x given y and conditional distribution of z given y. Okay. In other words, if you want to compute this probability gamma on some set uh, on three coordinates, you just have to integrate over this set and first you integrate with respect to um, x and z, this product of these conditional distributions. And then you integrate with respect to y. And the distribution of y is, um, is q. Okay, so that's the definition of, of this measure gamma. And clearly, by, by construction, you know, first of all, the coordinates x, y, um, and z will have distributions p, q, and t. And moreover, the pairs of coordinates, so the, the marginal of gamma on x and y, so let's write it this down, so marginals of gamma on x and y is uh, mu, on y, z, it's mu, okay? That's just clear from the definition. And so the coupling between the coordinates x and z that we are looking for will be whatever the marginal turns out to be in this construction on the pair of coordinates x and z. So, and let 
eta be the marginal on the pair of coordinates x and z. Right, and then we see that, uh, well, first of all, right, this marginal on, on this pair of coordinates will belong to the set that we want because the individual coordinates x will have marginals p and z will have marginals t. So this um, marginal on the pair will be in, in the set that, that we want. Okay. And then the triangle inequality that we are looking for will be nothing but a triangle inequality for the distance, right? Because the integral between of the distance between x and z with respect to this marginal, of course you can just write it as an integral of this function with respect to measure gamma on the whole space. So you can artificially add um, the coordinate y in this integration, right? And then simply use the triangle inequality to say that the distance between x and z is bounded by the distance between x and y and y and z. And then again, you use the fact that the marginals, when you integrate a function of x and y, you don't need, you can integrate out the z first, so you get the marginal mu. And for the second integral, you get the marginal nu, right? And so these guys were nearly optimal, so you get here w eq plus epsilon, and the second one is wq t plus epsilon, and you get what you want. Again, I remind you that the left-hand side was possibly suboptimal, so this is bigger than the infimum over all such measures eta with marginals p and t. Okay, and that proves the triangle inequality with two epsilon and then you let epsilon go to zero. Okay, so the proof in this case where you do have conditional distributions, regular conditional distributions given a coordinate y in this case is pretty straightforward because you just do this the first thing that comes to mind. You just do conditional independent coupling and then whatever the marginal that it will produce on x and z, right, it just gives you the, it witnesses this triangle inequality already. But what do you do in the case where, um, you know, perhaps your space is not complete and you do not know if uh, these regular conditional distributions exist, right? So that's, let's say, when SD is, is not complete. Well, in this case, one might think that it's enough just to consider completion, then take this result on the completion and bring th this back, sort of very similar what we did when we worked with a um, bounded Lipschitz metric. But it's a good good idea to think about this why it it might not work right away because and of course the point here will be that in the bounded Lipschitz case we just needed to have this one to one relationship between bounded Lipschitz functions on the space and on the completion because the optimization was over bounded Lipschitz functions here the optimization is over measures and you can always think of a measure on some space as a measure on the completion, but not the, not the other way around. So there is no um, a priori one-to-one uh, -one correspondence here. So in fact, the proof takes a different route here. And the way um, we prove this is noticing that when you optimize, you optimize this integral. Right, so you, you optimize this integral with respect to measures mu that have some prescribed marginals p and q. And so if this measure does not have conditional distribution, there is a way to regularize it without changing this integral much. But making clear this regularization does have conditional, uh, regular conditional distributions.
okay and the reason for this is is the following the way this is done is the following okay what you do is you when you consider this product space s times s um, just like in the proof of Strassen's theorem we can slice our space into a disjoint union of some small uh, of some partition uh, of sets of small diameter each okay so you can kind of slice your you slice your space um, on both coordinates okay and then if you look at one of these rectangles okay if you look at one of these rectangles here on the product space and you know let's um, zoom in on this one rectangle b i b j so you have this piece of some measure mu on the product space on this rectangle here and then what you can notice is that if you redefine this measure locally okay so you can sort of redefine this measure locally this will not really change your integral if you're only kind of smudging your measure on a small rectangle the distance between points will not change much will not uh, be affected by more than epsilon so you're not really changing the target functional that you are trying to optimize okay and and so then what one can do is simply redefine this mu to be just a product measure with the same marginals locally on on each rectangle so you can redefine mu just to be a product measure by keeping the same marginals okay first of all because if you keep the marginals the same locally your global measure will also have the same uh, original marginals p and q right so your global measure mu will be just a sum over all these rectangles of these local modifications okay and because you kept marginals the same locally this will still have marginals p and q globally and along the way the integral of the distance will only change by an epsilon because you only you know smudge things around locally so to speak the key point is then to notice that if your measure has such a nice structure it's just a sum over these countably many rectangles of product measures such a measure has a conditional distribution of one coordinate given the other in, a, in an obvious way okay you have to think exactly how to define it but you don't need the completeness uh, of, of your space for that so such a modification or regularization of your measure will have a conditional distribution okay so such mu prime does have the conditional distribution of one coordinate given the other and you can you know give it in an almost explicit uh, way and i'm not going to go over this here um, one should look at the notes and read this carefully to see what the construction is but basically this this finishes the proof so then once you have a conditional distribution for this regularization you finish the proof as above all right so this proves that w is indeed um, a metric on the subset p1 of all probability measures on our metric space when the metric space uh, is separable okay and so in the next video we will discuss uh, what is perhaps the most famous property or result about this Weierstein metric the so-called Kantarovich-Rubinstein theorem